So each year, People Magazine puts out their special edition, the 50 most beautiful people in the world. They also do the, you know, the 50th uh, or the sexiest man alive uh, episode as well. And, and if you're married, wives, if you think your man is the sexiest man alive, raise your hand. Come on, somebody be a little prouder about that, right? Let's be a little prouder about that. Some of you are kind of looking at them going, I don't know. <laughs> and some of you just didn't raise your hand, and it's going to be a tough afternoon for you. <laughs> Time Magazine also has the top 100 most influential people in the world. Forbes Magazine puts, puts together the, the richest people in the world. And, and back in 2016, Dos, Dos Equis Beer put together a commercials that, uh, that ran all the way up to 2018. And they are some of the funniest commercials about the most interesting man in the world. And some of you maybe have watched those before. If you haven't, just go onto YouTube and, and, and watch the collection. They, they, they're so funny. But, but in the last days... There will be a man who could very well end up in all of these magazines or in all of these categories. This man will enter uh, the world stage. He'll take center stage, and he'll be charismatic, and he'll be dynamic. He'll be charming. He'll be diplomatic, and he will be a persuasive genius. He's going to have problems uh, or excuse me, he's going to have answers to the horrendous problems that are in the world. He's going to, with boundless enthusiasm, ultimately get people to follow him as they readily throw their hearts to him and even, in a very real sense, begin to worship him as Savior and God. He will be, or he is, the most intriguing man in the world the most intriguing man in the world. And yet the Bible tells us who he really is. And that's what we want to look at today. 1 John chapter 2 says this to us. Uh, the Apostle John says, dear, dear children, this is the last hour. He's referring to the time of the end. And he says, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. You see, the most intriguing man in the world, Scripture tells us, is the Antichrist. Now, let's just be real for a minute. If you bring up this idea of an antichrist in casual conversation with somebody, how's that going to go? Right? I mean, seriously. People are going to look at you, and they're just going to laugh at you. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to look at you a little bit sideways. They're going to give you a condescending look. I mean, most people put the antichrist in the same category as Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, you know, Cupid, Dracula. He's a fable to most people. He's not real. And yet, for those who know Scripture and know that he's a real person, people have been trying to guess or speculate who he is as a person comes on the scene and, and, and has some of the characteristics of the Antichrist. And so for the last 2,000 years, people have been guessing as to who the Antichrist is. For example, all the way back in 37 A.D., just a couple years after Jesus uh, 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 resurrected, the emperor uh, Caligula put a statue of himself in Jerusalem, in the temple, and, and people thought this must be the Antichrist. 20 years later, Caesar Nero came onto the scene, and, and he, his intense persecution of Christians was so strong that people thought he was the Antichrist. In fact, people referred to him as the beast. Others throughout history have been labeled the Antichrist. You have Mussolini and Napoleon and Charlemagne. You have Hitler. You even have a military leader in Israel, modern Israel, Moshe Dayan. You had, some people have said it was Henry Kissinger or Mikhail Gorbachev or even prophecy buffs in, in, in the last few batch of years thought it was a Javier Solano from Spain. They've all been called the Antichrist. Many presidents have been thought to be the Antichrist. Roosevelt, uh, uh, Jefferson, Kennedy, Reagan, Obama, and others. And almost every pope, if not every Catholic pope, has been dubbed the Antichrist by at least some group. Some people even believe the internet 
is the Antichrist. And at times, they might be, I think they might be right. The Bible makes it clear. An Antichrist will come and arrive on the world scene in the last days. And in our passage today, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 13. I'd encourage you to turn there now. Um, and you're, no matter what notes go on the screen, you're going to want to make sure you have Revelation 13 as we, as we duck off sideways from time to time. You want to make sure you still have it in front of you. What we're going to see is we're going to get a description of this person. We're going to see aspects of him or characteristics of who he is. And this is important for us because the Bible makes it clear he is going to deceive many. Jesus even said in Mark 13, watch out that nobody deceives you. In fact, many, Jesus said, are going to come in my name claiming I'm he, I'm the Savior. And he's going to and will deceive many. This most intriguing man in the world is going to deceive many. So let's look at his characteristics. The most intriguing man in the world is first and foremost referred to as a wicked beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. It says, and I saw a what? Everybody say, and I saw a? I saw a beast and it coming out of the sea and it had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and each had a blasphemous name. There's a lot of um, symbolism there we'll talk about it in a minute. But this is how God sees him. This isn't a wonderful man. This is a wicked man. It's a, he's a vicious beast. He's not the most intriguing man in the world. He's the most insidious man in the world. In fact, the, the Greek word for beast is, is therion, and it means a wild, venomous monster. So much so that 37 times in Revelation, he is called a beast. Now, uh, he's given many different terms or titles in the Bible. In uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, he's referred to as the little horn. He's also called in Daniel 9, the prince that shall come. He's called the willful king and the idle shepherd in Zechariah. In the New Testament, the apostle Paul refers to him in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, or the son of perdition. And Paul also calls him the lawless one. All of these words, titles, they all speak of this one characteristic. He's a beast of a man. He's a wicked person. But in the beginning, as he comes upon the world stage, he isn't going to show these true colors in fact, we saw back in Revelation chapter 6 that he enters the world stage riding, you know, the symbolism there, riding on a white horse. And, 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 and he had a bow with no arrows. And that, what did that mention or symbolize? That he came to conquer, but he had a bow with no arrows. He came to conquer, and he wouldn't do it through force. He would actually do it through peace. Daniel chapter 7 tells us part of that peace is that he makes a peace treaty with Israel which somehow enables Israel to have their temple, whether it's built already or not, but to have their temple, to have their sacrifices take place in their temple. And so in the beginning, he's going to come across as a smooth operator. And the world is going to embrace him for his skills and his ability to bring peace and to bring hope to the world that is already beginning to feel the effects of God's judgments upon the world. We've talked about those really very real physical judgments that happened in the early days of the tribulation. The most intriguing man in the world. Even though he starts off as a peacemaker, the beast will eventually show his true colors. He'll eventually reveal his wickedness. So the second characteristic description we get of him is that he is indeed a conqueror. His goal isn't peace. His goal is domination and conquest. Look at verse uh, 1 again. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns and on each head of blasphemous name. Now here's where we get to the symbolism even more, which lets us know about his conquest. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. We saw in chapter 12 that the dragon is who? Does anybody remember that? That was the devil. That was, that was Satan. Uh, if you were at the men's retreat a couple weeks ago, I'd really encourage you, if you haven't already listened to the message, to check it out, watch it, or listen to it. But this beast, we get this picture, this imagery of all these animals. 
Do we see that anywhere else in Scripture? We do. We see similar language in the book of Daniel that, that, was, that happened or prophesied 600 years prior. And in Daniel's vision, Daniel got a vision of these kingdoms, these world-governing empires that were conquering and dominating the world. And Daniel also, he saw four beasts. The first, again, thinking about the language of Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, the first that he saw was a lot, Daniel saw, was the lion with the wings like an eagle. Then Daniel saw a bear, and the third creature that Daniel saw was a leopard that had four wings that moved swiftly across the earth. And then Daniel saw a fourth beast that had these ten horns like we see here in Revelation 13, verse 1. Now, scholars, they all, we don't have time to get into this. Scholars all agree that the lion in Daniel's vision was the kingdom or the empire of Babylon. And that the Babylonian Empire was fierce and it was ferocious like a lion. And then uh, scholars say that the bear or that Daniel saw was the Medo-Persian Empire. And it was a bear because it, it lumbered along. It was slow in its conquest. But its conquest was sure, it was strong, and it came in and took over the Babylonian Empire. The third beast that Daniel saw was a leopard. And the leopard represented the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. And if you know history, the Greek Empire, it came in quickly and swiftly. And young Alexander conquered and took over the world in a very short amount of time. And Daniel prophesied that these would be the case. He saw these before they actually happened. The fourth empire that Daniel saw was vicious and ferocious. It was a beast with ten horns. And the fourth empire that Daniel saw is an is a empire that would appear in the last days. So John, the apostle, he sees basically what Daniel sees all wrapped up in one empire with one man at its helm in charge of it all. And just for clarity, um, Daniel, uh, just for clarity, John actually tells us that this beast rises up out of the sea. Now, why is that important? I, I say that quickly because some people, uh, as you look at um, Daniel chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 17, Isaiah chapter 57, and Revelation 17, they all tell us what the sea is. It's representative of Gentile humanity. So he rises up out of the Gentile world. Uh, some people think he, this Antichrist is Jewish, but, but I don't see that in Scripture because the sea is representative of Gentile humanity. So he's some type of Gentile who's going to rise up and he's going to rule and he's going to reign. According to Daniel chapter 7, this world leader is going to form or be part of some type of global confederacy. And it's going to have power over the nations of the world. It is going to be the final world-governing empire. And it's the collection of these previous empires, so it's going to be dominating and strong and rapid and ferocious, and it's going to be controlled, this empire, by this beast, this antichrist. Now, that's a quick summary of a whole lot of chapters and verses that could take days and weeks and months to talk about. But one of the things that crosses my mind, and maybe it would yours as well, you think, how in the world can one person have such an impact on a global scale with so many different countries? I mean, okay, uh, I understand, I get it that, you know, the Roman Empire, or the Greek Empire, or the Babylonian Empire, or the, you know, the Medo-Persian Empire, those were regional in the truest sense. So how can one person actually impact the globe, so to speak? Well, let's think about that for a moment. First of all, it's only been in our lifetime that there's this, this buzzword called globalism. We all know globalism. We hear it all the time. And whether it's talking about, a, uh, you hear about global coalitions or global leadership or global economies or we live in a global village. One organization, and there are many, that are pushing globalism, some uh, very public, some more behind the scenes. One organization is the Democratic World Federalist, dwfed.org. Now, what they say, if you go on their website, you'll see that they say that the United Nations, uh, you know, the League of Nations back then, NATO, 
all of them have failed at their mission. They have failed to keep and bring about peace in the world. And so this organization says the only way to move forward in our world is to have a global movement, a global government with a global constitution, to have world law, to have a world economy. I want you just to listen to one small part uh, from their website as it pertains to corporations because they're clear. They don't, they don't hide any of this. They say, current movements around the globe are bringing attention to the effects that globalization and multinational corporations are having on the planet and its people. While these developments have benefited some, they have also harmed others and damaged our environment. Many of these institutions have little oversight or accountability to anyone but their shareholders. So a world federation will pass and enforce global laws to protect people, profits, and environment. And that's an appealing to mes message to so many, a world federation enforcing global laws. So imagine this person that Scripture talks about, this Antichrist, comes onto the world scene. He rallies together people of the world in some way, shape, or form into a federation, if you will. If you want to take it literal from what Daniel and Revelation says, uh, the number 10, whether it's 10 nations or 10 regions or, or 10 uh, conglomerations, whatever it may be, he's going to rally people and world, the world and nations together. And he's going to do that, he says, to bring peace and to solve the world's problems. But make no mistake, the Bible makes it clear. His goal is to dominate and conquer. That's the imagery of Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, which ties back to the imagery that we see in Daniel that talks about these world empires that exist to dominate and conquer. So what do we learn about this, this Antichrist, that he's, he's a wicked beast, that he seeks domination and to seeks to conquer. Thirdly, third aspect of this beast is this idea of wonder. Wonder. Let's look at this, verse 3, Revelation chapter 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound. The heads of the beast, this beast that they're talking about, we don't have time to get into that, this confederation. This antichrist has a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder. Everybody say wonder filled with wonder, and followed the beast. Back in the 1970s, there was a TV show that featured Lindsay Wagner. And she was the what? Does anybody remember? Some of you know the bionic woman. If you're under, I don't know, 50, ask somebody else, they'll tell you about the show. So for the rest of us old people, um, I conclude my, I'm getting older now, so I can include me and the old people. Um, there was also a guy by the name of Lee Majors, who was the bionic man, but he went by the title what? <laughs> okay, be proud that you're old, Ron. Come on. The six million dollar man. Well, the Antichrist, and, and the story of this guy is he was a test pilot, and, and, and he got in an accident, and his body basically fell apart, and so they had to put him back together with bionic parts, and it was six million bucks, and so he was a six million dollar man. Well, the Antichrist will be the six, six, six million dollar man. There's kind of a little play there. <laughs> Corny, I know, I'm telling dad jokes. See, something will happen, Scripture tells us right here, to the $666 million man. He's going to get wounded fatally. But somehow, some way, he's going to be healed or, or put back together, you know, like the bionic man or whatever it may be. And it's going to be so spectacular that verse 3 tells us people will follow him. One translation says they will pledge their allegiance to him. Some suggest he's going to die and be resurrected. Remember, Satan tries to copy everything that God does. God rose, raised Jesus from the dead. Oh, I can raise my guy from the dead. But somehow he's going to be healed, and so some think it's going to be an actual resurrection. I'm not so sure it's going to be a literal resurrection because only God has the power over life and death. But whether it, it's going to be some type of stage resurrection, if you will, it's going to be uh, something that he, he puts together, maybe a hoax of some sort. Because remember, all the way back to Genesis, what's Satan's primary tactic? 
It's deception, right? Lies and deception. And so just imagine you have this world leader who's done so much for the world. He's brought peace, and, and he's helped people in this difficult time of God's judgments. He's made a huge impact on the planet, and then he gets wounded somehow, some way, and, and maybe, pe- you know, proclaimed to be dead. And, and so he has his, he's in his casket, and hundreds of thousands gather to mourn his loss, and maybe the casket's clear. I don't know, but, you know, all of a sudden the casket, you know, you look, you see it, and you know, he starts moving around. There's movement in there, and he rises up. And I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but everybody is going to be filled with wonder because the fatal wound had been healed. And as he comes back to life or is healed or whatever the case may be, as the world is filled with wonder, that Greek word means they're mesmerized. That they, are, they admire him to this degree that they give their life to him. You think about it. He's brought peace to the world. He's, he's this charismatic leader. He solved some of the problems of the world. He brought peace to the Middle East. Who in the world has been able to do that? Nobody has. And now they're going to certainly be mesmerized at what they perceive to be a resurrection or a miracle of some sort. The world is going to be filled with wonder over this man. But... Anytime someone is filled with wonder, there's always the potential for what can come next, and that's worship. That's worship. And that's the fourth description or characteristic of this beast is worship. Revelation chapter 3, 13, verse 4, it says, So people worshipped the dragon, Satan, because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast. He's healed, or he's alive again. So now their wonder turns to worship. Their adulation turns to adoration. By the way, isn't this what Satan has wanted all along? Since even before time began, he has wanted to be worshipped. The verse, say, the verse says here that even as a result of this, Satan himself will be worshipped. Let's pause for a moment, talk about that. Uh, Satan, who is he? We know, we've talked about it here many times. we talked about it in this se- season uh, through Revelation. He's a created being, uh, an angel that God created that we call Satan. He was the greatest angel of all the angels. No one was above him except God. And for Satan, the except God was the problem. He wanted no one to be above him. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to have all the power. Isaiah chapter 14 describes it. It said, For you said to yourself, speaking of Satan, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens, and I will be like the Most High. Some of you know the story of Jesus' temptations. And in those temptations, what's one of the things that Satan wanted? That Jesus would what? That he'd bow down and worship him. That he'd bow down and worship. So this beast this antichrist. He's going to demand worship. How's he going to do that? Second Thessalonians tells us how it happens, and it tells us that he's going to oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped, and he'll set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. We've talked about that. Three and a half years into the tribulation period, he's going to walk into the temple and declare himself God. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes. By the way, when we say the word antichrist, the word anti can, of course, mean against. But also, in the Bible, the word anti means instead of. And so, this antichrist is somebody uh, who wants to be Christ instead of Christ. So, the world is going to uh, adore him, even worship him, especially after he seemingly rises from the dead. Well, there's another characteristic of him, and that's, uh, I'll just use the words in the Bible, proud words, proud words. Look at verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. If you've been tracking with us, 42 months, you've heard that term before, 42 months, 1,260 days, time, time, and half a time, they all mean the same thing. How long is that? Three and a half years, good, for those who remember that. Verse uh, 6, it, the beast opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. What do you and I know about dictators? 
what do we know about one of the ways in which they rise to power? One of the ways is through their ability um, uh, to speak, through their persuasive speeches to sway the crowds. Hitler, he was a master communicator who swayed a nation to follow him. This beast, this antichrist, by his words are going to rally people to his will. And by his words, he's somehow going to be, bring peace to the Middle East, something that no one has been able to solve. He's ultimately going to direct his persuasive words against everything that is God, against everything that is holy and righteous and just. I can picture it this way. I imagine when the church is taken out of the world, when the church is raptured, this beast, this Antichrist, when that happens and tens of millions and millions and millions of people are all of a sudden gone from the planet, he's going to probably somehow convince the world that it's about time these intolerant, fundamentalist extremists are gone from the world. The world is better off without them. It's an evolutionary step of humanity. And so he's going to, uh, when this happens, he's going to blast me, God. And he is going to elevate himself. And the world is going to embrace his message. They're going to embrace his proud words and his blasphemies against God. And that's only going to intensify his words once he is healed from the fatal wound. Finally, where does this lead? It leads to war. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, it says, The beast was given power to wage war. And against who? against God's holy people, and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So first of all, you have Christians who have been removed from, from the world, that God took them out of the world. And we discovered a few weeks ago that, that even though the Christians are removed from the world, there's going to be a, a massive worldwide revival of people turning their hearts and lives to Jesus, including God's people, the Jewish people. And, and millions upon millions are going to get saved. And even though the Antichrist originally promised peace, three and a half years into this this, this treaty he has with Israel. He's going to march into the Jewish temple. He's going to declare himself God. He's going to demand to be worshipped. And when he does, does that, he will begin to wage war on these newly saved Christians upon, and also upon God's people, the Jewish people. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I, you know, he's probably going to say, hey, you know, we got rid of all those Christians and look at how much better the world is and, and these new ones, we're going to get rid of them as well. And In fact, we're going to get rid of the Jewish people. We don't want any of them around and the world will happily go along. Daniel chapter 7 describes it this way. He'll speak against the Most High and oppress God's holy people. That word in Hebrew, oppress, means to persecute to wear down, to be cruel. And he's going to do that in all sorts of ways, which ultimately leads to death as he fights against Christ followers, against God's people, the Jewish people. And what I want to do is give you kind of a, a quick thumbnail sketch. We've been looking at, at a lot in Revelation. Let me try to summarize what we've talked about in just a few paragraphs the first three and a half years of this seven-year tribulation period before Jesus' second coming, the world is going to physically suffer greatly. We've talked about that. But even though the physical world is going to suffer greatly and people will suffer, there's also going to be some level of peace. Because through, the, through this antichrist power of persuasion and through deception, He's going to have some type of global coalition working together. But then, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, disaster will fall upon them. What is that disaster specifically? We know from Revelation chapter 12, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, that Satan gets kicked out of heaven permanently, no longer has access to heaven, and so now he's literally 100% stuck on earth. And it would seem that he goes and literally possesses this antichrist, 
And at that point, this, this Satan kicked out of heaven, so frustrated, so angry, possesses this antichrist, walks into the Jewish temple and says, forget your sacrifices, forget all that. I'm God. And he demands people worship him. And he declares himself to be God. Scripture talks about this over and over and over. It's called the abomination that causes desolation. And then it's at that point that all hell literally breaks loose. As bad as it's been, it's only going to get worse. This Antichrist will kill two-thirds of God's Jewish people, according to Zechariah 13. He's going to conquer the city of Jerusalem, according to Zechariah 14. He's going to deceive the rest of the world, and he's going to go on a rampage to kill those who love God and who follow God and choose to believe in God. Those who are saved, his goal now, all-out warfare against him. And the dragon, Satan, is going to empower this Antichrist to bring this about. He's also going to use the Antichrist's right-hand man, which we'll talk about next week. But as we close, we've looked at six characteristics or qualities or aspects of this Antichrist. So let's wrap it up today by comparing the Antichrist to the true Christ. I guess I would say there's really no comparison, is there, when you think about it? The Antichrist is called the man of sin. Jesus Christ was the sinless man. The Antichrist is called in Zechariah the idol shepherd. Jesus Christ is called the what? The good shepherd. The Antichrist here in Revelation 13 is pictured as a beast, but Jesus here in this passage is pictured as a lamb. Who do you want to follow? A beast or a lamb? Finally, the Antichrist's death was meant to deceive the world, but Jesus Christ's death was meant to save the world. And so I leave you with this question. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you have the confidence of knowing where you will go when you pass from this earth? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt, do you have that faith? If you don't, I want to give you that opportunity in a moment. And if you do, my question to you is, have, have we saying, have you been running to you? Have you been running to God? You don't want to be a person who's wrapped up and caught up in being deceived. Right now, a whole lot of forces in the world are doing everything they can to deceive you, to not follow God, to not believe in His truth, the absolute truth, the only truth. The Bible says God's Word is truth. There is no other truth apart from God. And everything in this world is trying to pull you in a different way and to get your focus off of Jesus Christ, off of running to Him and turning to everything else. And so if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you today to take a moment and turn to your Lord and Savior, to run to Him, to renew your faith. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you a chance to invite Him into your life so that you can join us, the family of God. Let's pray.